taping for my special. Please welcome Mary Beth Barone. Probably because I'm wearing chain mail in the winter. <laughs> I'm so excited to be here with all of you. You look so cute in your little outfits. I see a ride hat. Yes, if you, if you listen to the podcast, this is a little bit different. Because that's like chatting with your bestie. And this will be like when you're alone with your thoughts. <laughs> So it might be a little scary at times. Um, it's good to do this special. I've had a lot that I want to get off my chest. And I want to reach more people, because I'm the comedian critics are calling cold, unsmiling, and distant. It's actually just one critic saying that. And by the way, if there are any 55-year-old men here with blogs, please don't write about the show. Okay, because it's not for you. My show is not for you. This show is for girls and gay guys and the straight men who love us. Thank you. And I'm actually the first comedian to put a special on YouTube to cater to that demographic. Because right now it's all just comedy for incels. <laughs> so it's really important that you're here. And I knew I wanted to tape this in New York. This is where I live. I've lived here for 12 years. I'm never gonna move. Yeah, because New York City is the best city in the world. And sometimes people challenge me. They'll be like, well, how do you know that if you've never lived anywhere else? And I know New York is the best city in the world. I know this because two years ago, there was a news story about a man walking down the sidewalk in New York City, and he fell into a sinkhole full of rats. <laughs> and New York is still one of the most expensive cities to live in. He was up to his shoulders in rats. Like, I just don't think other cities could be getting away with that. I love it. I live in Williamsburg. Thank you. Yeah, my building is pre-war. The next war. <laughs> it was built in 2016. Kind of one of those charmless buildings that's ruining the city. <laughs> it's a big eyesore. But my priorities changed when I turned 30 in what I wanted out of my living space. Basic human needs, like a pool and a hot tub. <laughs> so I moved into one of those buildings. <laughs> and there's 500 units in my building, so I have a lot of immediate neighbors. I get to really observe how they live. And I can confidently say they are a danger to themselves and others. <laughs> I'll give you an example. I was up one day just in the hot tub, minding my own business. And this woman, she came into the hot tub and she brought her four month old baby. Yeah, try to picture a baby in a hot tub. It's very unnatural. Can't even really think of a comparison. If you type in baby in hot tub into AI, it will break. I think that's how we beat AI. So immediately I text my family group chat. I'm like, is this chill? And they respond very quickly, absolutely not. Not chill, really dangerous actually. Except for my one brother who loves to play devil's advocate. He was like, was there a sign? I was like, no, there's not a sign. I feel like we shouldn't need a sign for everything we're not supposed to do in the hot tub. So 20 minutes goes by, I'm getting a little worried, and I'm like, I like to fight for justice, and I am a total advocate for children. So I decide I'm gonna tell on this woman. 
I approached the front desk of the pool area, explained the situation. There was a woman in a hot tub with her four-month-old baby. And there's a twink working there. And he goes, oh my God, she's cooking the baby. Yeah. So now there's a sign. They put one up. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Empower your local twink. I've always said that. Any single straight gals here? Okay, cool. I'm looking for someone to set up with my neighbor. So he'll stop masturbating with the blinds up. It's like she's starting to affect my lifestyle. So I thought maybe if he has a different outlet. Because my building is a square and I face the courtyard. So I can actually see into my neighbor's apartments. And this guy on the fifth floor, he has his bed against the window. He likes to lay down and masturbate. So I've been watching. Because I feel like if you're going to do that where I can see it, then it becomes my business. Because then that's something that happened to me. And I had to take control of the narrative. So I've been watching and I'm totally sex posy. Are we all in here sex posy? Okay, cool. Anyone here sex neggy? Mm, few people. <laughs> well, I'm sex posy, but this guy has a very unique style. I've never seen anyone masturbate like this. He rests his laptop on his chest. Yeah, so he goes face computer dick. <laughs> Which is interesting. My first thought as a woman is, what's the cleanup? Because he's pointing that thing directly at the Apple logo. And I don't think Apple Care covers that. Because I've asked. So I watched him to completion one of the times. And just to be clear, I'm not like peering out my window waiting for him to do this. But if I look up and he has to be masturbating, I'm like, okay, that's what's on right now. The respect it deserves. So I watched him to completion and I realized that he wears a condom while he masturbates. So what I'm saying is there's a serial killer in my building. And I think I might be next. Although if I was murdered by a serial killer, I actually think that would be good for my career. Because then they finally make a TV show about me or at the very least, a podcast. Would you all listen? Okay, you're the problem. You need to consume media where women are alive. <laughs> this show's a good start. Let's see, what else do I have here? Austin Butler is AI. Come on. <laughs> Like, two humans didn't make that. <laughs> the media is really like pushing AI, like, watch out, AI is gonna take over, but I'm not worried because AI can't suck a dick. So I'll always have a job. Kind of an essential worker <laughs> in that way. I was trying to prep a, a stand-up set for late night TV last year, and I was told by the booker at the show that my jokes were too thought-provoking <laughs> for the American public. <laughs> so if anything I say gives you a headache, you can just step outside, <laughs> take a few minutes, and then come back in. I have small boobs. <laughs> oh, thanks. There I go being thought-provoking. <laughs> I do have small boobs. It's kind of a bipartisan issue. And they've always been small, but I've always wanted big ones. And I was raised Catholic, so I actually used to pray for boobs. I would make the sign of the cross, and I would get on my knees, and I would pray for God to give me big boobs. And when I never got them, that's when I realized that God is not a man in the sky looking down on us. Because a man would have given them to me. That's when I realized that God is a woman, and she's jealous. She knew I'd be too powerful. <laughs> Does anyone here want to own up to having just like massive knockers? 
Do you just wake up every day smiling? Okay, thanks for being honest. Usually people tell me that their back hurts. I'm like, everyone's back hurts. I don't feel bad for you. So I appreciate the honesty. Although I know all boobs are beautiful. Yeah, I love boobs, I'm bisexual. I wanted to, oh, you don't have to do that. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to call myself queer, but they said I can't because my hair's too clean. And if you don't know why that's funny, you're homophobic. You need to hang out with more gay people. When I say they, of course, I mean the gay review board. Because when you come out, you have to go in front of the gay review board. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's comprised of Andy Cohen, Anderson Cooper, and Miss Trenchbull from Matilda. Yeah, they're a really sweet bunch. And being bi is fun because gay people hate you. <laughs> and straight people don't believe you. And they especially don't believe you when you date a guy. And that's the one thing all bi people have in common. We all end up with guys. But I've learned so much from dating women. Like, did you know that lesbian sex is just tickling? <laughs> Takes a while, but we get there. And just because you're gay doesn't mean you're in the LGBTQ. Do you know what I mean? Like, Kevin Spacey's not in the LGBTQ. You can't be actively working against the community. <laughs> Ellen DeGeneres is borderline. She's under review right now. And it's my job as a white bisexual woman to tell you who and who is in, in the LGBTQ. I don't decide though, that's up to the gay review board. I'm just the messenger. I came out kind of late. I came out when I was 28 because growing up, I never heard the word bisexual. And I was actually taught that being gay was a sin. Because I was Catholic, I went to Catholic school, I did communion, confession, confirmation. And confirmation is this ceremony they do where they have teens renounce the devil <laughs> in front of their neighbors. <laughs> yeah, so I was indoctrinated, but I'm not, I'm not Catholic anymore. Well, I'm a reformed Catholic, we're called atheists. <laughs> and I'm just so grateful that I was raised in a faith that was so easy to turn my back on. because we're just not strong in our convictions. <laughs> Leaving Catholicism, it's like, wait, I don't have to wake up early every Sunday to hear a middle-aged virgin tell me how to live. <laughs> don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> Although, so I, I did go to Catholic school and the head priest and president of our school actually had some sacred wisdom that I wish he had shared with us. Because a few years after I graduated, he got arrested for embezzling church funds to pay for his boyfriend's apartment in New York City. Like, I wish I knew how to do that. Defrauding the Catholic Church, that's cunty. None of the students were surprised to learn that he was gay. All of his sermons were about himself. And he was just like too decadent to be a priest. He was really flashy. He had purebred golden retrievers and he drove a red Corvette convertible. Yeah, a priest should never drive a convertible. A priest in a convertible, that's like a baby in a hot tub. <laughs> Just shouldn't happen. We radicalized my parents, so no one in my family is Catholic anymore. Yeah. My mom hasn't been to church since she saw Spotlight, so. <laughs> Movies can change the world. And I was actually a miracle baby because my dad didn't want kids. And they already had five. So, there's six kids in my family. It's three girls, three boys. So we're just like the Brady Bunch. Or if you were born after 1997, it's like the Jonas Brothers plus the Heim Sisters. <laughs> With a lot less singing. And by all accounts, our parents loved us, but they did get us a trampoline as a toy. 
which I feel like is something you only buy your kids when you can afford to lose a few. <laughs> I did have an amazing childhood, though. So. If I could give my younger self advice, it would be to always pee after sex on each other. Yeah, I thought you guys were sex posy. <laughs> Someone loves piss play. That's cool. Who knows, the love of your life could be in here. No, but seriously, I, the younger advice, the younger, Hold on. The advice I would give to my younger self, sorry, you threw me off with the pit. Now I'm thinking about piss. <laughs> so that can make a girl flustered. <laughs> the advice I would really give to my younger self would be to cheat more at school. Because I cheated a little bit, but I definitely could have cheated more. Because I didn't realize that school doesn't matter. And I think part of not cheating was out of respect for my teachers. But now that I know teachers, <laughs> Now that teachers are my age, I know that they did not deserve my respect. Because <laughs> they're like heroes, they change lives, they're so amazing, but teachers are also the most fucked up people I've ever met. <laughs> like, are there any teachers here? Okay, yeah, I know what you're doing later. <laughs> What's that expression? Those who can't do teach, those who teach do coke. <laughs> I support you, I think it's great. Shaping our young minds. I think we need an overhaul of the history curriculum in this country. Yeah, because we never get up to like any of the actually relevant or important stuff. And that's because every year in history, no matter what the actual subject is, they start with ancient Egypt. <laughs> Which is really cool. But then by the time school ends, we only get up to the point where we won World War II. And it's like, why do I know all the steps to embalm a body? <laughs> but I don't know the geopolitical atmosphere that led to the fall of the Berlin Wall. <laughs> I don't even know when that was. <laughs> 70s, 80s, 90s? There's no way of knowing. <laughs> but I have been trying to fill in the gaps and like use my time here to share what I've learned. Um, the Vietnam War. Have you guys heard about this? <laughs> it was a whole thing. I watched this Ken Burns documentary about the Vietnam War, 17 hours long. Yeah, when I saw the documentary was 17 hours long, I was like, whoa, how long was the war? <laughs> Turns out it was pretty long. And the documentary has a lot of footage of the Vietnam War. Like they actually had cameras on the battlefield. Like imagine if you got drafted and you show up day one at war and they're assigning jobs and it's like, so you're gonna do guns. We'll put you on tanks. You will be a content creator. <laughs> yeah, and shoot horizontal. There's a lot of good information in this documentary. Like the US got involved in the war in Vietnam knowing that they were gonna lose. Which I kind of respect, because that's basically what I'm doing every time I get involved romantically with a man. <laughs> yeah, I've been dating one for four years. I call it my Vietnam War era. Because <laughs> I'm engaging with an enemy I don't understand. When things start to go badly, instead of withdrawing, I just pour in more resources. <laughs> There's a lot of damage, a lot of regret. It's like, where's my purple heart? What's your favorite war? World War II, that's a little basic. <laughs> World War I, it's like always the bridesmaid, never the bride. No one ever says World War I. What's your favorite war? You. Civil War, okay. All right, virtue signaling. How about you? What's your favorite war? World War II also, see, you guys need to learn, see, this is why they need to teach us more. Have you even, like, the Cold War, pretty cool. The Cold War, well, it wasn't a war so much, like, in a technical sense. The Cold War was just the U.S. and Russia being like, why I oughta? <laughs> and then we just, like, went to space. 
The Cold War was camp, is what I'm saying. Because in the Cold War, they had this big clock called the Doomsday Clock, and they said that if it struck midnight, the world was gonna end. Like a gay guy thought of that. <laughs> Up until kind of recently, gay guys weren't allowed in the military. There was a rule, no gay guys in the military. <laughs> and I actually think only gay guys should be in the military. Because they're so hardcore. They're getting railed in that. <laughs> Every time they have penetrative sex, they are getting railed in the ass. Like, that's who I want fighting for my freedom. <laughs> yeah. Them and female bartenders. Just think they'd get a lot done. The first time I told that joke, a gay guy came up to me after the show and he said, I'm a veteran and I felt really seen by your joke. <laughs> So I saluted him and I said, boots on the ground, the house down. And he knew exactly what I meant. I love that we live in an age of sexual exploration, but I do feel like vibrators are getting a little crazy. So they keep inventing these new ones. They have this new vibrator that's a tiny little suction cup. You just stick it on your clit and it sucks all the demons out. And it works, but at what cost? <laughs> Brands will send me them for free. I had one sent to me that's three times the size of this microphone. Yeah, if you held it out the back of a boat, it would work as a motor. I'm not gonna sit on that. Blast me into space. <laughs> this isn't the Cold War. <laughs> We're not just going there. I feel like next they're gonna be like, buy this gun and point it directly at your pussy and you will have the most intense orgasm of your life. I might try it if it's free. Can't hurt more than a bikini wax. Yeah, and I've been waxing since high school, so I'm a lifer. I actually have female pattern baldness which is where you've waxed for so many years that you physically are unable to grow a bush. Because, <laughs> oh, okay, so women used to have to wax from the eyebrows down. If they got to 2005 in history class, you would know that. <laughs> but I'm used to it now. Actually, my favorite part of the waxing experience is when the waxer will leave the room for you to take your pants off. She's like, well, I'm gonna go. I'll leave you to it. I wouldn't want to see anything. <laughs> and she walks out as if she's not going to walk right back in and see my entire spread pussy and butthole. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, you know what, Marta, let's cut the shit. <laughs> Sit right there and we'll get started. <laughs> Guys love eating pussy now. This is new. It didn't used to be that way. I think it's great, but have you ever been with a guy who's a little bit too enthusiastic? Where it feels like maybe he's compensating for something? Because I love eating pussy too, it's so fun, but no matter how hard you go down there, it's not gonna undo whatever you did in college. <laughs> like the allegations will still be there. <laughs> not all guys are bad though. I'm pro Pete Davidson, I decided. Yeah, I think he's setting a good example. Because Pete Davidson is willing to date a woman publicly. Which many men are not willing to do. Like, he dates a woman for one week and they are courtside at the Knicks. For the whole world to see. Meanwhile, Craig, a graphic designer who lives in Bushwick, who you've been sleeping with for three years, won't post you on his Instagram story. For his 312 followers. Craig, if you're here, M. Rat is not coming. <laughs> She's never gonna notice that you like all of her photos, even the ones with her kid. <laughs> I do date a guy, like I said, but he's British, so he's queer-coded. 
And even though I date a guy, I actually don't think guys and girls should date. Because we have nothing in common. Because girls like to talk about things and boys like to talk about stuff. There's a huge divide between things and stuff. Because girls were always talking about like reproductive rights and political activism and how's your family, right? And guys just want to like Google the population of Minneapolis. <laughs> They're obsessed with the populations of different cities. It has never once occurred to me to Google the population of a city. That's none of my business. <laughs> to me, every city is a population of one million and I get through the day just fine. <laughs> I'm wondering if any of the straight men in here want to be brave and admit to me the city that they most recently Googled the population of. You can just shout it. Mexico City. Mexico City. <laughs> <laughs> what did that add to your life? <laughs> Nothing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> See, that's what happens when you have all your rights. When you have all your rights, you wake up and you're just like, ooh, what do I do today? <laughs> your rights are still there. I'll Google the population of Mexico City. Cool, cool, cool. Now I guess I'll just throw on a condom and masturbate. And then take a shit for one hour. 60 minutes. It takes men to shit. I feel like the perfect intersection of things and stuff is this debate about trans athletes. Because it's about human rights, which is a thing, and sports, which is decidedly stuff. <laughs> People like to make it seem like a complicated issue. I actually don't think it's complicated at all. First of all, it's women's sports, so the stakes could not be lower. <laughs> but then, well, I'm not saying I agree with how things are, but that is how things are. <laughs> And to me, it's like, if we let trans women compete in sports, what's the worst thing that's gonna happen? She's gonna beat you in a race? You're gonna lose a race? Oh no. Should we get out the doomsday clock? I'm, I'm so baffled by TERFs, trans exclusionary radical feminists. I don't know how anyone takes them seriously when they're all so fucking ugly. It's like, why are you worried about preserving womanhood when you look like that? <laughs> Femininity is not your concern. <laughs> and there's no way in hell they're participating in competitive athletics. <laughs> Unless they've invented a new sport you can play while you're holding an iPad. <laughs> and Candy Crush doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, just put the iPad down, brush your hair. Then we'll have a discourse. <laughs> Who loves iPads more, TERFs or six-year-olds at a dinner table full of adults? <laughs> I wonder. And if you think that's mean that I said they're ugly, just remember that they think trans people shouldn't exist. <laughs> so I think what they're doing is objectively worse. Also, it's like trans women are not the enemy. Trans women are women. Men are the ones invading women's spaces. There's a men's section at Madewell now. Like, that was a place for us. Yeah. Pisses me off. Speaking of transphobia, I'll tell you a story about my grandma. <laughs> she actually died when I was five, so I don't know if she was transphobic. There's a lot of questions I never got to ask her. <laughs> but apparently, when my grandma was on her deathbed, Keep in mind, I was five years old. My grandma was on her deathbed. She hallucinated. She turned to my aunt. She said, Mary Beth is at the foot of the bed, and she's on a stage, and she's using vulgar words and telling dirty jokes into a microphone. Yeah, and my aunt told me this recently. I know you're thinking, you're probably thinking my aunt made that up, but I know she didn't make it up, because this is my Aunt Donna from West Virginia. <laughs> she's Republican, so she doesn't have the mental capacity for whimsy. Like, she owns a gun. So I know that really happened. 
so my grandma had this premonition that came true, or she put a curse on me. <laughs> Depends on how you look at it. <laughs> I used to be Republican. Yeah, I was Republican for 20 years. I was really worried about taxes when I was 14. <laughs> but I'm not ashamed of my past. Like, I'm happy I went through that because people who've been liberal their whole lives are so smug. They're just like, oh, well, I've always been a good person. I'm like, okay, well, I learned how to gaslight when I was seven. And I can actually argue things that don't make sense. So, who has more life skills? I do. I'm fully liberal now, I vote, I retweet. That's kind of the extent of it. And I can't say that I'm hopeful, but the texts from the Democrats right now are not helping. Are you guys getting these? They're like, please, we are begging you on our knees. Please donate $5 to save democracy. You need $5? How did you let it get this bad? I'm never calling my senator again. They're doing worse than I am. Not hopeful. My dad's retiring, he's 78. And he was asking my siblings and I what he should do when he stops working. And I was like, 78? Have you considered running for president? It's a little young, but I think he has good ideas. I just can't handle another Trump presidency. I really can't. It, it did affect my life, Trump being president, because yeah, I had to get informed. <laughs> I was so oblivious before. And it's good to like know what's going on, but it was kind of nice. <laughs> I had to learn like all these new vocabulary words, like gerrymandering and midterm elections. <laughs> before Trump won, I thought Clarence Thomas was a character from To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> Yeah, I'm different now. <laughs> and our systems have failed us. Like, we're reminded of that every single day, just walking around. I flew into JFK, John F. Kennedy International Airport, and <laughs> I saw this big sign they have up at JFK now. It has a picture of a woman on it, and she's been crying. So I thought maybe she was hungry. <laughs> but then I read the sign, and the sign says, it's up to you to put an end to human trafficking. If you see someone being human trafficked, let us know. It's up to me <laughs> to put, I'm the first line of defense against human trafficking? I'm a comedian. I don't have the skills to put an end to human trafficking. That feels like a job for, I don't know, Liam Neeson? And I would love to help. Of course, I would love to help identify people being human trafficked while I'm waiting at my gate. <laughs> but I'm not exactly sure what to look for. Do they wear like a badge or a specific t-shirt? Or should I just look for heterosexual couples where the girl looks mad at the guy? Because I think that's gonna be most heterosexual couples at the airport. She's probably been there all day because he gaslit her into arriving five hours early. <laughs> As it usually goes. I know how to gaslight. I learned. That is something women have to learn. We're not born with the innate sense to gaslight like men are. Because women, we're not here to play games. We just want to be upfront with people. And that's why you will never see a female magician. <laughs> they don't exist. Because men have made an entire career, they've built an industry on playing tricks on people. <laughs> they get paid to do that at parties. It's like I almost respect it. But I would never say I respect magic. <laughs> Plus, I feel like if girls were magicians, we would just tell all of our friends how they do the tricks. Because <laughs> we don't keep secrets from our friends. It's just not what girlies do. I love comedy. Being a woman in comedy is so fun because the goal is to get so successful that you become the most hated person on the entire planet. <laughs> and if my comment section is anything to go by, I think it's working. <laughs> yeah, thank you.
you. Men are so mad at me for speaking. But I don't like to focus on the negative. It was so heartwarming watching New Yorkers come together as a community this summer to kill as many spotted lanternflies as possible. Because science said we had to kill them. And people were overcome with childlike wonder just stomping out these bugs. Like if you saw someone and it looked like they were doing that like sand walk from Dune, that's what that was. Joke for the straight guys. You get one. This collective hatred of spotted lantern flies, it created a closeness, this intangible bond formed by having a common enemy. So that got me thinking, like, how could we use this to heal our country? Because we're so divided. And I think we need a new common enemy. So I need you to hear me out. I think what this country really needs is another 9-11. Yeah, and I know what you're thinking, how could we do another 9-11 when Bush is no longer in office? So who's gonna plan it? But I've really thought this through. And I'm not saying we do the exact same thing, right? You can never do 9-11 today. First of all, it's January. But also, the bad guys can't be people of color. That's problematic. So in my version, the bad guys are white, it's Russia. All right, so I have this whole plan. So Putin is gonna send over two missiles, but they're not nuclear, they're just the chill ones. We don't want any casualties, so the first missile is gonna hit a gun factory. But no one's at work that day because they had a mass shooting there the day before. So all the survivors got to stay home, which means that the mass shooter actually saved lives which he will hate. <laughs> and of course, it's a he. <laughs> so that's the first missile. Second missile is gonna come to New York. It has to. But it's gonna either hit the Museum of Ice Cream. <laughs> or that honeycomb thing in Hudson Yards. happy as we would be to see both of those things gone. <laughs> Russia has threatened our freedom. Our freedom that gay guys have been fighting for for a few years. <laughs> so the right and left, they put their differences aside. We defeat Russia. We get the piss tapes. <laughs> Finally. The war in Ukraine is over. Dua Lipa's cover of Proud to be an American goes double platinum. <laughs> Charlie XCX does a verse on the remix. And suddenly, for the first time in a long time, it's feeling like these colors don't run. <laughs> and maybe, just maybe, you'll have a new favorite war. <laughs> Thank you. Just pr promise me you'll think about it. Okay, then my job is done. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. You've been amazing. Love you guys.